Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library for April 20th. I am Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group, and I am joined, as always, by my colleague and fellow reader, Claire. Thank you, Kirstra. <laughs> I am Claire. I moderate uh, the historical group on Facebook and also as the page turns here at the library. So, mm -hmm. Excellent. And today we are doing just a roundup of things that we've been reading. Yes. Although I was telling Claire just before we started recording, I have an unofficial theme to my books, <laughs> uh, which is three star reads. Well, I have one of those. Yeah. The other two I are, are really, I like them and I've been waiting to talk about one because mm -hmm. I read it as an advanced reader copy. Nice. So I've been waiting till it yeah. got published. So. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, but with the, the three star reads too, I mean, these are books I think that have a lot of things going for them. And just because maybe like I had some issues with part mm -hmm. of it, those are sometimes the best books to talk about right. with people. Yes. I have found. Yeah. So, cause you can like, you disagree about stuff and right. everybody sees different things in the book. So yeah. yeah. So, so. <laughs> you can tell me if you've read any of mine and what you thought about them. We like hearing your opinions. Absolutely. Um, but Claire, do you want to kick us off? I do. Um, I'm going to kick us off with the one I was most looking forward mm. to. I don't have a copy of the book because this is the one I read as an advanced reader copy. It's called Memphis. It, it is a debut by Tara M. Stringfellow. Um, wow. This novel, it just I felt like it just took me right to Memphis. Hmm. Like you could see, hear, you know, almost smell everything that she was describing. Um, the really interesting thing to me is that she based some of this story on her own family history. Uh, Tara hmm. Stringfellow is another writer that was a former attorney. So her research okay. skills, she said, played very much into writing this. Um, it's a story of women in, in Memphis and some of the struggles they go through, but yet uh, each of them is involved with a man that has had some kind of problems. Mm. So we start out with the, the matriarch, Hazel. Her husband is the first black detective in Memphis. He was also a World War II veteran. Um, he built their house himself, and he was lynched. Yeah, dragged oh. him out of the river and never really said what happened to him. So he was part of the character because the house that he created has lived on and kind of encompasses all these other hmm. characters. Um, and the, All right, so I, I'm losing myself here. <laughs> then we have Hazel's daughters, which is August and Miriam. And then Miriam comes back to live with her daughters, Joan and Maya. So it's... It's an intergenerational tale, mm -hmm. and it, it kind of jumps around a bit. So you, that was the one thing I did not like reading this book in an arc, because in books like this, I like going to that family tree that they usually have in the beginning mm -hmm. to try to figure out where I am. Bookmark or sticky note yes, on that page. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so the center of the story is the house that spanned out in all directions like a wild southern maze. So the first time you see it, she uses just beautiful language the honeysuckle drew hummingbirds the size of baseballs so i'm just picturing all of yeah. this um this also was chosen this month as jenna jenna bush hager's yeah Look you know you. I you've her. got you. i know but I you have, read it first i did you've got your I finger did. on the pulse. i wonder if she had her finger you know she's following she you on good reading reads. my mind uh, <laughs> so this was the her today show book club so the story begins in 1985 miriam is coming home to memphis with her two young daughters um, she's leaving her abusive husband, who is also a military man, um, mm -hmm. and came back from, I believe, Iraq mm -hmm. with a lot of issues. Um, so it's a blend of fact and fiction. It, it incorporates a lot of real-life events. Um, the fact that Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis mm -hmm. when he went there for the sanitation worker speech, and he right after he gave his, I've been to the mountaintop, um, also 9-11, um, hmm. And you see these women struggling without the men in their lives, trying to put their lives together. The other interesting thing is the wife of the uh, the police officer that was murdered. His wife became the first black nurse at the local hospital, which I can't think of the name. It was a 
ba- Zion, Mount Zion Baptist Hospital mm-hmm. in Memphis. So that's the other thing is these women are trying to get an education. And then the one granddaughter is a very talented artist whose mother is trying to push her into a medical field so she doesn't have to depend on a man mm-hmm. and she is determined to see her gift out and she ends up creating portraits of these women that you visualize in words but also you can kind of visualize in your mind so it does have a lot of violent things in here there are there's one really thing that really bothered me was um a rape that happened to one of the girls. Mm. So just putting it out there as a trigger warning, there is domestic abuse, there's police brutality. I mean, it's got the whole gamut. Mm-hmm. But on the whole, I really like the book, and it ends hopefully. So It sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. That one's been on my list um, since we were researching for, like, our... Right, the books that are... Books to look forward to Yes, this and year. it was definitely on my list, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Going to have to get to that one sooner rather than later, I guess. Okay. Well, I hope you like it as much as I did. Yeah, I do too. (laughs) All right. So let me start with, let me start with this one, I guess. Um, So this is The Other Black Girl by Zakia Delila Harris. Um, This one was... um, a Good Morning America book club pick for last year. And there's a lot of good stuff going for it. So the kind of tagline on Goodreads is um, Get Out Meets the Stepford Wives. Mm -hmm. So I was like, of course, Kirster is going to read this book. Oh, that was a a very buzzed about book. It absolutely was. So our main character is Nella Rogers. She is... um, In her mid-20s, she's working as an editorial assistant at Wagner Books. She's also the only black employee of this very prestigious publishing house in New York. Um, So she's just, you know, kind of struggling, putting in the hours, dealing with um, a workforce that is not necessarily entirely white. But again, she's the only black employee. So you can kind of imagine what that situation might be like. And then one day in walks Hazel, who's a newly hired editorial assistant, who is also black. She was raised in Harlem. She's got dreadlocks. Like they are swapping natural hair care tips. Like this seems like it's going to be a great thing until. (laughs) Um, So until Nella finds a note on her desk, an anonymous note that just says, leave Wagner now. And she has to figure out like, who left it, was it Hazel, who seems to be getting along much better than Nella ever did. Like, she's just primed to skyrocket where Nella is still very much grinding in her place. Um, Or is it one of the other employees at Wagner? We don't know. So the plot kind of takes off from there as Nella kind of starts to become increasingly, like, paranoid about what's going on she gets a few more notes she has no clue what's happening and so that's all that's all great right like that's all very interesting um the problems that I had with this book is that I found the the middle section just dragged like it's not a terribly long book but I feel I don't know there's there's probably at least 50 pages in there that I felt like could have just been tightened right up. <laughs> uh, just tighten it up. Um, and the ending wasn't very satisfying for me. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm not sure whether I just, like, maybe I'm not the target audience for this book, and that's why it didn't quite hit for me Um, but I also found myself not a hundred percent sure what point the author was trying to make by the end Um, so again that could just be like a reader book mismatch thing Mm -hmm. but so this is one I actually would like to talk to somebody else about who's read it and see kind of what their perceptions were okay well it's so. been on my list so i yeah. will challenge myself yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah and then we can go and then we'll talk. coffee and talk absolutely yeah because yeah i think yeah. i think there will be things to talk about okay so yeah sounds good mm-hmm. all right my next one was another debut um, excuse me i love a good debut 
Peach Blossom Spring by Melissa Fu. This one was my daughter's and my um, Book of the Month Club pick that we had together, I believe, from March. Um, and this one, the one I liked about it is I know very little about Chinese history mm -hmm. at all. Um, <laughs> it starts in 1938. Um, and this is another one that was inspired by her father's real life experiences. Okay. So that kind of made it a little bit more real for me. But it goes from 1938 to about 2000, mid 2000s, 2005, I have written down. Okay. Um, so it's the story told in three voices. You have Mei Lin, who is a young wife and mother. Um, and her son is four years old. His name is Ren Chu. Um, and then we have Renchu's point of view, and Renchu eventually becomes Henry when he moves to the United States. And then Henry has a daughter named Lily. So we have these three points of view. Um, so what happened is, like, in 1938, the Japanese were invading China. Mm -hmm. And you have these families that are totally displaced. So Malin's husband... Oh, I'll just spoil it. He's killed. He's killed early on in the novel, so don't get mad at me. You know, you, you, she has to deal with it for the entire book. So anyway, she and her son go with her husband's brother and his family, like, to try to find safety. Um, the one thing she has from him is when they were married, he gives her this beautiful antique scroll that was exquisite, and it told, like, different stories of folk tales so in order to keep her son like who was four remember and they're trying to hide different places mm -hmm. and everything else she tells him these chinese folklore stories which i found very interesting too um and that was a way that they bonded together during some of the really horrible things that mm -hmm. were happening to them um so they end up in taiwan henry is smart he's worked hard he actually goes to america for college he never never wants to really come back um he marries a white girl they have this child and of course lily is the daughter she's very curious about what happened to her father and why she doesn't meet anyone and what his story <laughs> was and he just does not want to talk about it because mm -hmm. you know when then after the japanese the communists came different people are killed you know what side were you on Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was a lot for him to process. So he decides to just opt out. Yeah. Block it out. But he's even worried about the allegiances in America. Like once he mm. gets to the university system, like which one of his friends are going which way. And they try to position him to get information. So hmm. it, it was very interesting. So anyway, um, grandma does come to visit finally. And Lily and she bond. They bond over food, which, of course, I love that. Mm -hmm. And gradually she does get her father to tell the story. And I won't say how or what happens. But um, it was really good. It kept me intrigued. I thought the cover was beautiful. It's a very pretty it's cover. Gorgeous. So, yeah. If you like history, I'd highly recommend this one. Nice. So. Yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah. I know you like an intergenerational story, oh, too. Oh, God. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I'm going to go next with mine that has the prettiest cover, which is Wahala by Nikki May. And I like, it's so pretty. Yeah, it this is. Cover. It's stunning. So this book is a debut, um, and it features three Anglo-Nigerian main characters. So they are all um, half Nigerian and half um, European living in England. Um, so we have Ronki, who is the person, she works as a dentist. She wants the picket fence and the family, like, so bad, you can just tell. Um, and Boo who has a family. She's married to a French man. They have a daughter. They have a house. And she is feeling um, frustrated as like a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. And then we have Simi, who is married um, to a white man, to a British man, um, who they have like, um, they are child-free. They have a very sort of high-flying way of life. She's a like a marketing executive um, very well to do and these three friends have been friends since college um, they're now all in probably their early to mid 30s um, and you know they 
have their own lives, but they've maintained their friendship and they get together for lunch at a Nigerian place or drinks or whatever. So they're all, you know, ticking along as they go until Isabel shows up. And Isabel was childhood friends with Simi back in Nigeria. And they haven't seen each other for years and years, but Isabel kind of blows into the scene and inserts herself into this little friend group. And then immediately things start to go wrong. Like we start seeing cracks in this friendship. um, And, you know, I think maybe you're not supposed to be able to tell that it's Isabel, like obviously causing chaos, or maybe you are supposed to be able, but you can tell (laughs) immediately (laughs) that like Isabel is the agent of chaos here. Um, What you don't know is why. Um, And then as things kind of pick up steam, that, comes to be kind of the central any good question. secrets oh there are many secrets oh i love a good many secret. secrets okay um which isabel either seems to know or find out and then things go downhill from there so um there's there's lots of you know if these people only actually talk to each other <laughs> they would like <laughs> figure it all out there wouldn't oh, yeah. be a book um <laughs> It's a page turner, though, like, and it gets kind of increasingly implausible towards the end. Like, things really pick up steam and just kind of barrel along towards the end. So I definitely kept reading. Um, But I, of the three friends, I only found one of them, like, even remotely likable. Like, I just didn't think they were good people. Like, I was like, meh. Um... And the end went kind of a little off the rails bonkers. Oh, okay. Um, So there's that. And there were, you know, as you read through the comments on Goodreads and whatnot, a lot of people made comments about um, subtle and not so subtle colorism within this book and within the characters. So... It's a lot to unpack there. Like, mm-hmm. it's definitely entertaining um, and a very quick read, um, but some issues on the other side of that coin. Okay, for me. All right. So interesting. Mm-hmm. I might be intrigued though. Yeah, I mean, and if you do decide to pick it up, like I said, it is a quick read. Like okay. you will just broop, breeze okay. right through it. All right. Well, speaking of quick reads. Mm. And here's the shocker of the day. <laughs> Claire picks up chiclet romance. Yeah. Who are you? I know. Claire <laughs> the cynic. Um, the only reason I did <laughs> is because it's called The Invisible Husband of Frick Island by Colleen Oakley. And by reading the description, actually someone was checking this out. And I looked okay. at it and was like, wait a minute, that's not Frick Island. This is Smith Island. You are not fooling me, Colleen mm-hmm. Oakley. Um, and in her notes, she said that she visited there when she was young and thought it would make a great, great, you know, scene or destination mm-hmm. for a book. So, well, there you go. For those of you that don't know Smith Island, they are famous for Smith Island cake, which is about a 10 or 12 layer, very thin layers of usually yellow cake with chocolate mm-hmm. frosting. My brother's favorite dessert and probably up there on mine as well. So I digress. <laughs> but anyway, our main character is Piper who is married to a young guy. They got married young, probably early 20s. She's known him for eight years. Her mother was a biologist, I believe, or some kind of like scientist on Smith Island, um, whose main industry is crabbing, maybe oysters, Mm -hmm. you know, in the Chesapeake Bay. So he goes out one day on a crabbing run and doesn't come back. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. Yeah. so there, his body is missing. They find the boat. Mm. So she one day wakes up after being, you know, very depressed for about a couple of weeks and decides she sees him and goes about life like he's there. And the 90 or so townspeople, you know, love her so much and are so heartbroken for her that they just kind of go along with it. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. So you have Invisible Tom, mm-hmm. you know doing their normal date night at the one-eyed crab and she goes off to meet him at the boat in the morning and yeah so 
now you have the whole town that's doing this. So yeah. um, you can't decide whether that's like heartwarming or deeply weird. troubling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this young reporter whose career has stalled, he's dreaming of being a major podcaster. And he gets assigned this little fluff story of covering the Frick Island Cakewalk, which is when they auction off these cakes. So he goes over um, and he gets a mysterious email that says, you are not covering the more obvious story, you know, the story that needs to be uncovered on the island. So he decides to go back and investigate further. And then he meets Piper and Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then decides that he's going to do this podcast. He calls it What the Frick <laughs> about this girl who, you know, doesn't have a husband, mm -hmm. but the whole town is acting like she does. And meanwhile, he kind of tricks the town into thinking he's there because they have a lot of environmental concerns, mm. like with climate change, you know, the waters are rising a lot of the crabs and oysters are dying. This is a known fact. Mm -hmm. um, so they are thinking he's investigating them on mm -hmm. climate change. And that, my friend, is what really made me hate Anders' guts. Because it's yeah. like, you are a big lie liar. <laughs> and not being at all fair to this girl. And of course, now that he's doing this story, people are getting <laughs> invested. And he's getting, you know, millions of followers mm -hmm. because they're following this right. poor, pathetic Seems girl. Seems a little dishonest. Yes. And of course, meanwhile, she's falling in love with him. And it's like, you dummy. He's mean. So... He wasn't me. Well, and also, what about your invisible husband? Yes, yes. Well, yeah, mm. that all gets resolved. Okay. I'm not going to spoil all of that. <laughs> the one thing I did like is the end. And it mm -hmm. wasn't just like wrap it up in a bow mm -hmm. kind of romance. She decides that, you know, her life ended pretty quickly. I mean, she loved her husband and she wanted to get married young. But in the same time, she is also very interested in bugs and kind of some scientific things like her mm -hmm. mom. So... I won't tell you what she does, yeah, but yeah. I agree with the decision she made. So nice. Um, but I, you know, perfect, like a three out of five mm -hmm. things I really didn't like, which when you really don't like, like the main character love yeah, interest, man, it, the romance is a, not going to do anything no, for you. No, no, it's not. It's like you're a jerk, Anders. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sorry. Mm. Yeah. Well, but it did make me think of cake and I do, I do want to go there one day, mm -hmm. so. Cool. Yeah, Invisible okay. Highland, uh, husband of Frick, a.k.a. Smith Island. <laughs> so. All right. Um, so my last one is A History of Wild Places by Shay Earnshaw. Um, and this one, I don't remember how it got on my to-read list. That was a Book of the Month Club pick. Oh, I was it? I always pick that book. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. It's one of those I was looking through my TBR on Goodreads and I was like, oh, this looks good and it's on the shelf at the library. Let me pick it up. No recollection of how it got there. I digress. Um, so this is a book in two storylines. Um, we start with the storyline of Travis Wren, who is a mess, like a mess of a guy. Um, he kind of scratches together work as... Um, kind of a private investigator, he finds missing people. Um, and we find out that he actually has, um, he's like a little clairvoyant almost. Like mm -hmm. if he touches something that a person held, he gets like after images and he can see a little bit of what happened. So he uses this to track people down. Um, but he is, like, not holding his actual life together in any way. Um, so he's, like, kind of at the end of his rope when he gets hired by the family of a missing woman to try and find her. And the missing woman is Maggie St. James, who is the author of a series of children's books um, called Eloise and the Fox. And these books are super dark, like super dark kids' books. Um, and she disappeared not long after one of her young readers died. He read the book and decided to go on an adventure like the character does in the book. Oh, dear. And he passes away. 
Oh. So this is, like, not great, obviously. And she feels some kind of way about it. And she just disappears off the face of the earth, as far as anyone can tell. So her distraught parents hire Travis to try and find her. So he is tracking her down. The trail's running cold. He gets a one-word clue, which is pastoral, um, which refers to or seems to refer to this kind of mythic community, commune, something that no one is sure if it is real, if it actually exists, if it's just kind of a legend. But he goes off to try and track her down and to find pastoral, and he disappears as well. So that's kind of the setup. And then we switch completely gears, and now we're in pastoral, and we have our main characters here, Kala and Theo, who are husband and wife. They live in a farmhouse with Kala's sister, B on the edge of the woods in pastoral, which is just like a self-sufficient utopian um, utopian yeah basically and they have no contact with the outside world they are completely self-sufficient um but things might not be exactly as they seem as as it so often goes i was gonna say (laughs) as it as it does it basically always does um so the rest of the book we're kind of trying to piece together what actually is going on in pastoral like Is there something kind of rotten at the middle of this paradise? Probably. (laughs) Were any foxes harmed? That's my... No foxes were harmed. No foxes Um, were harmed. And then we're also trying to figure out how the story of Kala and Theo connects back to the story of Travis Wren and Maggie St. James. So that's kind of the the focus of the rest of the book is, is unwrapping those mysteries. And that part was not as compelling to me. Uh, I think some of it you kind of you put together on your own, so it's not quite as mysterious as maybe the author thinks that it is. Um, but the part that I did think was interesting was how the characters cope with the information that they find. Like, what do you do when you find out the truth behind the lie you've been living, right? And how do you reconcile those parts of yourself? So that part I thought was good. Um, The mystery part was not as compelling. And there was some stuff that kind of dragged. But mostly there are excerpts from the Eloise and Fox books kind of scattered through. And that's the book that I want to (laughs) read. Give me Eloise and Fox. <laughs> you can keep this one. <laughs> that's so, too funny. Yeah. So that's where I came down on that one. <laughs> All right. Fair. Mm-hmm. So an interesting week. Definitely. Um, So we'd love to hear from you all. If you've read any of the books that we talked about today, please do let us know your thoughts. Um, If you read any of mine and you didn't find them to be three-star reads, I would legitimately love to talk to you about what you thought and how your opinions differ um i almost yeah. want to read all of yours just to see yeah. i mean that would be okay i know <laughs> but we all know how long my to be red pile is i so. know i know yeah which reminds me that we're coming up soon it will be time for the stack, for the of, stack shame. of shame yeah. so that'll be in june it's always one of my favorites. Yes. Um, but next time we're going to be talking about mysteries, I yes. think, right? Yes. Mysteries you and I in both May. Love mysteries. So yes. So that will be very exciting. That'll be the first Wednesday in May. And until then, we will see you and let us know what you're reading. Yeah. Happy reading. <laughs> boop boop boop. <laughs>